Welcome to Bitchy History, the irreverent history podcast that doesn't really want to increase your anxiety, but this episode will just go to show that one tiny mistake on someone's part can lead to two centuries of increasingly bloody wars. So, read contracts before you sign them? Welcome to episode 17 of the show, where we are once again exploring the key moments that led to the beginning of the American Revolution. I know, I know, this episode is late. I'm making a habit of that recently. I'm very sorry. But I have a good reason this time. I have been neck deep in a website redesign for my research consulting company all week and doing a lot of work to start finding new clients to grow my business. And time just got away from me. But hey, if you hop on over to rtphistoricalconsulting.com, you can see the new website. And if you or anyone you know is in need of my company's services, send me an email. Last time, we briefly skimmed over the military history of the first three French and Indian Wars, which leaves us with only one more to discuss, and it definitely deserves its own episode for several reasons. The fourth French and Indian War was one of several wars taking place concurrently, with one alliance led by the Great Britain and the other led by, well, the French, obviously, hence the name. The other concurrent wars were the Seven Years' War, the Carnatic Wars, and the Anglo-Spanish War. One reason this war needs its own episode is that unlike the three previous French and Indian Wars, this one was its own war, not just a spillover intention from the Wars of Succession in Europe. How do we know that? Well, because the French and Indian War starts in 1754, and the Seven Years' War doesn't actually start until 1756. Because it's essentially an entirely separate war, despite involving the same countries as the previous three, I'm not going to spend much time on discussing the particulars of the European wars. If this was a European history or world history podcast, I certainly would. But alas, this is an American history, women's history, and queer history only zone. And despite the fact that the Seven Years War does involve the Holy Roman Empress Maria Therese of the Habsburg Dominion, the only woman to hold that position in her own right, that's just not enough reason to do a full rundown of this war on this show itself. And again, unlike the other three wars which started in Europe over issues of succession and spilled over into the colonies, the French and Indian War is actually viewed as the roots of the Seven Years' War. So for once, it's issues in the colonies that are lighting a powder keg in Europe instead of vice versa. Overall, the justification for this war is imperialism and empire building. Essentially, who is going to get global power and gobble up the most land in colonized areas? That's a, well... That's honestly the cause for most of the wars over the next couple of centuries, let's be honest. And while the remaining unresolved kerfuffle over land rights from the previous three French and Indian Wars is a major factor in this fourth war, namely who got ownership of the Ohio River Valley region, which may very well be the first time and the last time anyone was that invested in Ohio, except for the weird period between 1964 and 2016 when Ohio was seen as some kind of mythical bellwether for who would win the presidential election. Somehow, for 56 years, Ohio was on the winning side of every presidential election. Until 2020. They called that one wrong. But this time, the war was less about the sovereignty of who had control of those lands and more a personal financial vendetta by one particular figure from colonial history. The man. The myth. The legend. Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie of the Colony of Virginia. I'm kidding. He's not a myth or a legend. In fact, this may very well be the first time you've ever heard the name unless you happen to live in Dinwiddie County, Virginia, or called Dinwiddie Hall your home when you were attending the College of William and Mary. Which is a shame, because Dinwiddie sounds conveniently like Dimwit, which is a remarkably good description for this guy. Maybe I'm being too harsh here, but you can judge for yourself as I explain how he started the French and Indian War. What? You thought I was going to talk about someone you recognize, like George Washington? Don't worry, we'll get to him later. So Dinwiddie is the lieutenant governor of the Virginia colony under two different governors during his career, Governors William Ann Van Keppel and Governor John Campbell. But because the royal governors couldn't really be bothered with visiting the colonies they were supposed to be governing and were usually notably absentee, William Ann was governor of Virginia from 1737 until his death in 1754, and he never once stepped foot in Virginia. Dinwiddie ends up being more or less the de facto head of the colony during his time in office. 
How much of the start of the French and Indian War is exactly Dinwiddie's personal fault is moderately debatable. There are those pesky loose ends from the previously poorly constructed peace treaties, which led to boundary disputes that have to be considered, but it would be disingenuous, and more importantly, less funny, to only give that one sterile reason and leave out Dr. Fred Anderson's speculations on Dinwiddie's own financial reasons for his aggression against the French in the Ohio country. In his book, Crucible of War, The Seven Years' War and the Fate of Empire in British North America, Anderson goes into this extensively. You see, Dinwiddie was a stockholder in the Ohio Company, one of those joint stock companies that litter the history of the colonies and created the first major trading posts and cities of the English colonies like Jamestown and Plymouth. Robert Dinwiddie was one of the original members of the Ohio Company, along with several other more famous names like Richard Squire Lee, not Richard Henry Lee, we'll talk about him later, George Washington, and a few other founding fathers like George Mason and John Francis Mercer. The Ohio Company was formed in 1748, and in 1749, King George granted them 500,000 acres in the Ohio Valley. Only there was a catch— They got the first 200,000 acres immediately, and then they got the rest of the 300,000 if they managed to settle 100 families in the next seven years. Sure, fine, that shouldn't be a problem. The population of the colonies is booming at this point, and getting 100 families to move to the Ohio Valley shouldn't be that difficult. Except for one very big problem. King George may have granted them that land, but that doesn't mean the French agreed that all of that land was King George's to grant. France still very much feels like some of that is their land, and that's going to make it pretty difficult to construct a fort and a garrison and establish safe areas for settlers. And if there's no safe place for settlers, they aren't that likely to want to take a chance moving to Ohio, of all places, when the more established New England and Southern colonies are an option. So they have seven years from 1749 to get this land settled, which means they need 100 families, a garrison, and a fort by 1756. The pressure is on. If the Ohio Company can't fulfill their end of the deal, not only do they not actually make any money off of this venture, but they also lose out on that further 300,000 acres, which would suck. So the Ohio Company starts trying to develop the area, beginning with building roads into the territory. As a side note, we really take the existence of roads for granted today, to be honest. Every time I realize that people in the 1750s had to actively build roads to get access to places... I'm amazed for some reason, and after this many years studying history, I still don't know why that's the thing that shocks me consistently, but, well, my main focus is the Cold War, and I still take the existence of the interstate system for granted, even though I know it didn't exist when my dad was born. But back to Ohio country. The Ohio Company is aggressively working on getting their new land settled, sending out surveyors, building storehouses, but trouble is looming because no one can really agree where the British territory ends and the French territory begins, and Dinwiddie is pretty damn insistent that their land grant includes the area around what is now Pittsburgh, but the colonial government of Pennsylvania disagrees, and so does France. France claimed land in North America that included everything drained by the Mississippi River, which includes the Ohio River, which seems like an unreasonably large claim to me that covers way too much land and is also wildly unspecific. But hey, I once saw a modern 20th century land deed that dictated that the end of someone's property was the third oak tree north of the creek, which is similarly unhelpful. Yes, that was a Texas survey map. How did you guess? I swear, that map was created to fuel a Hatfield versus McCoy-style feud for future generations. Which is basically what this land survey did for the British and French, actually. France is severely not amused by Dinwiddie and the Ohio Company making inroads into the Ohio River Valley, and they send in soldiers to enforce the French sovereignty in the area. The French established Fort Duquesne in 1754 at the confluence of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers, and and yes, for those of you screaming at me, I'm aware that I butchered the pronunciation of at least one, maybe both of those names. I'm sorry, but frankly, not sorry enough to figure out how to actually pronounce them and correct it. You're also going to hate how I pronounce every French word that comes up in the rest of this episode. Dinwiddie isn't particularly happy about the building of this fort, so he sends out a military unit led by a 22-year-old lieutenant colonel by the name of George Washington to the region. And it doesn't go well. Washington had tangled with the French before in the Ohio River Valley. In 1753, he had been sent to deliver a diplomatic warning to the French, basically a politely worded version of an eviction notice. This is British territory, pack your shit, and get the hell out. 
I will now insert a dramatization of the French response to this. We shall take your castle by force. You don't frighten us, English pig dogs. Go and boil your bottom, sons of a silly person. Ah, blow my nose at you, so-called Arthur King. You and all your silly English kniggets. What a strange person. Now look here, my good man. I don't want to talk to you no more, you empty-headed animal food trough whopper. I fart in your general direction. Your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. Is there someone else up there we could talk to? No, now go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Well, okay, maybe that's not 100% historically accurate. History books do describe it as a polite rebuffing of the warning. But how polite can the French be? They're French. In the spring of 1754, Washington is sent back with a force of around 200 militiamen, and he's ordered to defend Virginia's claim to the forks of the Ohio River, modern-day Pittsburgh. In a dawn attack, Washington and his men end up attacking an encampment of French soldiers, wounding their commander, Joseph Coulon de Jumonville. In the aftermath, Washington believes he was preventing a French attack on his own men, but the wounded leader begins to explain that he had been on a diplomatic mission only. While he's trying to clarify that, sources say that Washington's Seneca guide, Tanagrasan, killed Jumonville with a tomahawk blow to his head. Washington and his men retreat to build a stockade, which they name Fort Necessity. The fort is not big enough to house all the soldiers, conditions are poor, there's almost constant rain, which for anyone that's experienced spring in that area of the United States, yeah, that tracks. And Washington realizes quickly that he is outmanned, outgunned, and not likely to get out of this alive. To be honest, his little troop of 200 militiamen hadn't started out that well supplied in the first place. In fact, we have a letter from March 7th of 1754 from Washington to Dinwiddie, which states that Washington's men are much in want of cutlasses, halberds, and officers' half-pikes, and that some of the equipment sent up to them is very bad and is scarcely worth the trouble of carrying. The men, he writes, are also very much in want of clothing, and many are not actually in uniform because no uniforms were given out. Washington also wants to know who is going to be paymaster for the regiment and when his men can expect to be paid, which... As a person who has personally had payroll screw up before at different jobs I've worked, it kind of makes you a little bit nervous about the entire solvency of the people you're working for when that happens. Of course, they end up under attack by French soldiers and their native allies, surrounded, outnumbered, and quickly running out of supplies. Washington makes the executive decision to save the lives of as many of his men as he can by taking French terms of surrender. So Washington gets the French Articles of Capitulation, which are written in French, obviously, and reportedly soaked in rain when he gets them. But even though he can't really make out what the Articles of Capitulation say, he signs them. Now, I do remind you that signing contracts without reading them is generally a big no-no. But when you're surrounded by a bunch of angry Frenchmen and half your men are starving and probably have dysentery or some other gross era-appropriate disease, they kind of have you over a barrel and you don't have much room to discuss terms. Unfortunately for Washington, the Articles of Capitulation he signed without understanding them fully described him as being personally responsible for the assassination of Jumonville. This admission would become the basis for the French declaration of war against Britain. The only thing worse than inadvertently starting a war because you didn't pay close enough attention in your French class would be getting stalked by the Duolingo owl for ignoring too many reminders to do your lessons. Listen, I'm busy. I'll get back to my German lessons eventually. Stop threatening my friends and family. And thus, a war begins. If we want to apportion blame, we can put about two-fifths on the poorly constructed territorial boundaries and the treaties from the first three French and Indian Wars, another two-fifths on Dinwiddie and the Ohio Company, and maybe one-fifth on Washington getting an F in French conjugation and grammar school. Maybe even less than one-fifth, since even if Washington had been perfectly fluent, what was he going to do? Negotiate for better terms while surrounded and outgunned? I don't think so. He kind of made the only choice he could, given his remarkably bad situation. Especially considering that the leader of the French that had them surrounded and outgunned was Jumonville's brother. Now, I personally wouldn't start a war over the death of one of my siblings, but apparently the Jumonville brothers got along better than my siblings and I ever have. But that's the opening volley of the French and Indian War, a convoluted issue of territorial colonial boundaries and profit protection by a joint stock company trying to settle the Ohio country. 
As per usual, I have zero interest in getting into the nitty-gritty details of the actual battles here. That's just not my area of history by any means, and there's probably 200-plus decent military history books on the war at your local Barnes & Noble. The overarching important fallout of this war is something we'll talk about in a future episode, but the important bit I'd like to mention here and now is that this war is the moment when George Washington begins to become the figure we know more or less, from the history books. Despite that early failure, which we really can't blame on Washington himself since he was sent out undersupplied and without nearly enough men to do what Denwitty wanted him to do, Washington would end up gaining a lot of positive notoriety during this war, and it would give him the military experience he would later rely on as the general of the Revolutionary Army. It was also the publication of Washington's journals from his expedition to Fort Leboeuf in 1753, which were published under the title The Journal of Major George Washington, which went a long way to convincing those in power that the Ohio River Valley was of great importance to securing Britain's control over the North American part of their empire, which would eventually lead to Britain sending in military forces to fight this war in the colonies. So I guess the greater context of the French and Indian War is maybe more than one-fifth Washington's responsibility. But look, hindsight is twenty twenty. Washington's service in the French and Indian War would see him promoted to being the commander-in-chief of the Virginia Militia Forces, which he would hold until 1758. Though his time as commander-in-chief was plagued by the British Army underestimating Washington at every turn because of his comparative lack of military experience and education. This would shape Washington's views on the relationship between the colonies and the British, because to some degree he felt as if he was being undervalued or found inferior by the British because he was from the colonies. Which... Given the context of the song Yankee Doodle during the American Revolution, that definitely does track with the way Britain seemed to view the colonies. Hicks. But we'll talk about that in more detail later when we get to that period of history. The French and Indian War drags on for several years with a lot of back and forth on who has the upper hand at any given time. But eventually the war is decided in Britain's favor, helped along by some strategic choices in the European Seven Years' War, which divided France's attention sufficiently, making the colonial war swing in Britain's favor. Ultimately, the war ends with the British victory in 1763, but numerous policy issues at the end of the war will end up creating the necessary friction points over the next decade, which will ultimately lead us into the American Revolution. Thank you for tuning in to listen to me bitch about history. Next time, we'll be taking a brief break from working our way through American History 101 for another episode of How Did America Get Here, where we'll be talking about a very interesting slash infuriating bit of anti-feminist rhetoric that I've seen being utilized a lot lately, mainly that life was so much easier for women before the women's lib movement forced them out of the home and into jobs. It's a lie, and a very dangerous one in this era of continuous pressure by the religious right to push women into a pre-1973 life. So let's talk about what life was actually like for women throughout the Western world in the past and discuss why romanticization of history is a problem, not just for historians, but for the world as a whole. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you back here on Monday.